Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching my talk. My name is Susani Calagari. I am a PhD student at the Center of Theoretical Physics in Warsaw. Uh, this work, Contextuality and Memory Cost of Simulating of Majorana Fermius, was done in collaboration with my advisor, Michael Spaniet, and my dear friend, Juan Ibermejo Vega. So if you're gonna remember only one minute of this talk, this should be this one. So in a nutshell, what we did, we connect contextuality and the memory cost of simulating, uh, classical simulating quantum processes. So there's this very cool paper by Angela Karanjay when she, did, uh, she does exactly like this, uh, but it's a little bit restricted because the sub theories that she's working on this paper, they are closed sub theories. So what does this mean? Uh, in the sub theory, if I have, in this closed sub theories, if I have two observables, the product of that are allowed in the sub theory, the product of these two observables must also be in the sub theory. And this is not the case for many uh, families of observables, right? So, what we did, we generalized this idea to non closed families of observables with a broader proof of contextuality. This uh, one by Abramsky and Bredenborg that has uh, the, the, the paper over here. And we apply this method to quantum computation models uh, based on Majorana fermions. So the topological quantum computing uh, by easing, with easing annuals and uh, fermionic linear optics. So the outline of the talk. First, I'm going to explain what I mean by classical simulation of quantum process. And then I'm going to show you the lower bound for this classical simulation. Uh, and then you're going to connect contextuality and the lower bound in the memory cost. And then we're going to apply this to topological quantum computing and to fermionic linear optics. So, okay, classical simulation of quantum process. So, a quantum process usually starts with an input state, a quantum input state, and then we can do some transformations, we can do some measurements, and we have an outcome. So, the goal of the classical simulation is to reproduce quantum statistics by, given by the Born rule. So at the end, we want to have a probability distribution of um, a probability of obtaining the outcome K, given that we start with the uh, input state Ho, we have some transformation T, and you do some measurements M. So this means that we can have a dictionary, uh, something that is mapping the quantum world with the classical world. So in the quantum version, we have the quantum state here given by Ho, and in the classical version, we have the probability distribution mi ho uh, lambda, where this lambda belong is a this lambda is internal state, and it belongs to the state space uh, big lambda. For transformations here in this work, we have the unitary channels that map quantum states to quantum states, and we have in the classical version stochastic maps that maps. Um, that updates the probability distribution to a new probability distribution. For the measurements, we have non volumen instruments. Here, uh, CP maps that map uh, uh, a quantum state to a quantum state with certain probability. And in the classical version, we have the substochastic maps. Another thing that is very important here in, in this work is single shot distinguishable states. So, if uh, two quantum if two quantum states in the sub theory can be distinguished in one shot, this means that in the classical version, the support the intersection of the support of these two states is empty. So here, for example, I have this in red and in blue, two probability distribution uh, of two different states, and the support the intersection of the supports are empty. Okay, so. We can finally talk what is the memory cost of the simulation. As you may notice, everything is always happening in this in the state space. We have the probability distributions, and everything that we are doing here is only updating this probability distribution. Okay, so the memory cost is the log of the cardinality of this probability of this state space. Uh, so then I can give you the first result. So we have a lower bound in the cardinality of the state space. So in a sub theory, there are some, uh, some number of states that are allowed in the sub theory. Let's set that the set is S total, the set of all states allowed in the sub theory. 
So then the lower bound in the cardinality of the state space would be the number of all states in the sub theory divided by M. And M is the largest set of states that are uh, that, are, that can share at least one internal state. So for example, let's imagine that this is my sub theory. So I have I have uh, four states that are allowed in the sub theory. And here we can see that uh, this, uh, there are three states here that are sharing one internal state. So this M would be three in this case. Another uh, thing is very important is partitioning measurement. Uh, so an observable O is a partitioning measurement for a set of states S. If the set of post measurement states contain at least one pair of single shot distinguishable quantum states, for every outcome K. So then we have a really cool theorem that if there is a partitioning measurement for the set S, this means that, that the intersection of the supports of this uh, probability distribution of the states is empty. Uh, okay, so uh, really briefly, I'm gonna try to explain to you what is contextuality in the sense that we are, we have the proof of contextuality that we are using that is coming from the Abramsky paper. So giving a set of com uh, commuting observables uh, here and a set, of com uh, a set of corresponding eigenvalues. Also, let uh, new be the function that maps observables to, the, so to uh, some eigenvalues of these observables. So then the non-contextual value assignment applied to a sequence of projector measurements would be one if these uh, eigenvalues match the outcomes and zero otherwise. So the non-contextual uh, non contextual assumption here is that uh, the value assigned uh, to a projective measurement is independent of the context in which it's jointly measurable. Uh, okay, so now we have con uh, partitioning measurement and we have contextuality and we can put them together. So let S be the set of quantum states and OS be the set of observables, uh, uh, all observables that at least one eigenstate in S. So uh, we have a result that says that if OS is contextual, this means that there is a partitioning measurement for the set S. Okay, so now we have a really cool line of, of implications here, right? So if I have, if my set of observables is contextual, this means that there is partitioning measurement for S, and this means that these um, probability distributions of the states are disjoint, okay? But this is completely the opposite of what we are looking for, because for the lower bound, we needed uh, the maximum set of states that do share one internal state, right? So what we can do is to reverse these arrows of implications. So now we have uh, exactly what we need. So we have, that the set, if, the, if we have a set of states that share an internal state, uh, this means that there is no partitioning measurement for this set. And this means that this uh, corresponding set of observables, OS, is non-contextual. Okay, so now the, the, I think the main result for this paper. So now we can have uh, the lower bound written in three different forms, okay, for each one of these. Um, so the lower bound for the, card for the cardinality of the state space can be written with this M, which is the maximum, the largest set of states that share one, that share one internal state, or the largest set of states that do not allow partition measurement, or the largest set of states in which the corresponding set of observables is non-contextual. So, okay, now we can take a um, a minute to breathe a little bit because this was very intense, a lot of definitions, a lot of theorems. Uh, but that's it. We have a really cool method. If your uh, sub theory is contextual, we can find the, the lower bound for the classical simulation. And we can now apply this to some, uh, to some models, right? So the first one is topological quantum computing. But first, I need to explain to you really briefly what is a Majorana fermion, right? So Majorana fermions uh, were proposed by Ettore Majorana uh, as, a, as a solution for Dirac's equation, but we don't have any, uh, and, ah, of course, and they can be described by 
Magellan operators that have this anti-commutational relationship. Uh, but we don't have any evidence that this particle really exists in the fundamental way. And it's a fundamental particle. But these, uh, these uh, particles, these Magellan families, they appear in condensed matter, and especially in topological quantum computing, which is <laughs> my interest in over here. And the model that we are going to uh, use here is this one uh, given by Bravi in 2006. And actually, this is the first this is the first paper that used um, magic state deletion for bringing universality. So, the quantum computing model, we can measure uh, pairs of Magellan operators. We have uh, this uh, unitary that is called the braid gate. And this unitary maps Magellan operators to Magellan operators. Uh, something very cool about this, this framework is that we can write, you can describe the states in the stabilizer group. So for example, this uh, zero state when N is the number of uh, fermionic modes, it's stabilized by these pairs of Magellan operators that goes from uh, uh, x12, x13, until x2n minus 1 to n. So to describe, one, um, to describe one quantum state with n fermionic modes, we need 2n Magellan operators. Uh, any unitary from this, um, from this sub theory can map, this, uh, can map these states to another state that's going to be um, that's going to be stabilized by this other x. When you can just apply the unitary to this um, to these measure observables, and what is going to happen is that we are going to create a permutation here in this um, index of the Magellan operators. Okay, so now we can skip like uh, three months of my life of computations and try to understand this this paper trying to compute this, and I can give you the result. So the lower bound for the topological quantum computing with easy onions is n log n, and this is a very cool result because this is a tight lower bound. Uh, that's it, so we can now go to fermionic linear optics because fermionic linear optics, it's very similar to topological quantum computing. Uh, we have the states are described from uh, also from Magellan operators. They can also be written as the stabilizers, you know, with the stabil uh, described by stabilizer group. Uh, the measure observables are also uh, pairs of Magellan operators. The difference now is that my unitary here, uh, it's, um, it's, it's exp exponential, it, we have this eight AIJ, which is a anti-symmetric real matrix. So now I have a continuum, a continuum set of, of unitaries, which means that I have a continuum set of um, possible states um, in my sub theorem. So, uh, of course, remember that uh, to compute the lower bound, we need the, the, cardinality, the cardinality of the set of states, right? The number of states that are allowed in my sub theorem. And in this case, we have a continuum. So, what we can do, we can discretize. The set with, with a epsilon net, and the lower bound, the exon approximation, fermionic and optics is n square, and of course it depends also the the size of the the epsilon ball, and that's it. So this is also a tight lower bound, uh, and this uh, this model here is this um, is the one described by uh, Tero and Di Vincenzo. And that's it. This is the results for fermionic linear optics. Um, so, in summary, what we did, we create, we we have a method to find the lower bound for classical simulation of uh, quantum process when we do not require that, um, that this the set of observables is closed, and we apply this uh, this result this method to to computing the lower bound on the classical simulation of topological quantum computing with easy onions and also for epsilon approximation fermionic linear optics. So thank you so much. <laughs>